Uh, my name is Anjan Malik, and I'm uh, delighted to have been asked by the CIAT in Yorkshire to speak to you today. Uh, I'm a partner in the law firm Hill Dickinson, and I specialise in construction law. Uh, I'm based in Leeds, uh, we've recently moved to our new offices on Wellington Place, uh, which we're very proud of. So if anyone would like to pop in for a coffee, please just connect with me on LinkedIn and we can sort that out. So uh, I'd like to talk to you over the next 35 minutes about these three topics. The role of the principal designer, collateral warranties and what the court says about their status as construction contracts and the adjudication process. And as Nathan said, there'll be some time left at the end when you can ask me any questions uh, on any of these three topics or anything else relating to construction law, uh, and I'll do my best to, to answer them. So if we start with the role of the principal designer, uh, there's four aspects uh, I'd like to cover. And these are the general duties of the principal designer, the additional duties, and roles of the principal designer, uh, competence requirements, and then we'll finish with practical considerations. Uh, so as a reminder, the principal designer is one of five duty holders. The five duty holders are the client, uh, designers, contractors, the principal designer, and the principal contractor. And we're going to focus on the 2023 building regulations which were brought in through the 2022 Building Safety Act. And the purpose of this regime is to ensure that the principal designer, as a duty holder, takes appropriate responsibility for ensuring that building works comply with building regulations. And Regulation 3 of the 2023 regulations uh, defines a uh, principal designer as the designer appointed to perform the duties of a principal designer under these regulations. So this means a designer who is appointed to have control over the design of the works. The principal designer has four general duties, as well as specific duties relevant to designers, which we will come on to later. And the general duties are contained in Regulation 11J. The first duty is planning, managing and monitoring. So any person carrying out the design work must take all reasonable steps to ensure their design work is planned, managed and monitored so that the design is compliant with the relevant building regulations. The second duty is cooperation and the duty of cooperation among all duty holders is to ensure building work is compliant with the relevant requirements. The next duty is consideration before making appointments. Regulation 11E requires that before any person points another to carry out design work, they must take all reasonable steps to satisfy themselves that the appointee fulfills the competence requirements for their role or is in training with appropriate supervision arrangements in place. Also, parties must not accept being appointed to roles carrying out design work unless they satisfy the relevant competence requirements. The fourth duty introduces additional general duties for higher risk buildings. Regulation 11E requires that as part of the inquiries that are to be made before appointing someone to carry out design work or to the role of principal designer, in respect of higher risk buildings, the appointing person must also ask whether a serious sanction has occurred in relation to that person within five years prior to the date of the appointment and consider any information available to them relating to the misconduct of that person. Under Regulation 11D, 
in respect of higher risk buildings, the client must also keep a written record of steps it took to satisfy itself of the competence of the principal designer. And any person making an appointment must give the client a written record of the same. And under the higher risk building procedures, the client is required to provide a competence declaration to the building safety regulator as part of its building control approval application, confirming the client has complied with its due diligence duties. The client is also required to provide a construction control plan as part of the building control approval application and a compliance declaration by the principal contractor and principal designer as part of the application for a completion certificate. Let's next look at the additional duties of the principal designer, which are very much focused on the coordination of designs and building work. First, the principal designer has to plan, manage and monitor the design work during the design phase. Second, the principal designer is to coordinate matters relating to design work so that all reasonable steps are taken to ensure that the design is in compliance with the relevant requirements. Third, the principal designer must take all reasonable steps to ensure that designers and any other person involved in relation to design work cooperate with the client, the principal designer, the principal contractor and each other. The principal designer also has to ensure that the design work of all designers is coordinated so that the design is in compliance with the relevant requirements. And the principal designer also has to take all reasonable steps to ensure that designers and any other person involved in relation to design work comply with their duties. And finally, the principal designer must liaise with the principal, principal contractor and share with the principal contractor any information relevant to the planning, management and monitoring of the building work. We can talk about this later, but the more competent the whole of the professional team is, the easier it is going to be for a principal designer to carry out their duties. Moving on, where the principal contractor provides comments to the principal designer in relation to compliance with uh, the relevant requirements, the principal designer must have regard to those comments. And the principal designer must, if requested, assist the client in providing information to other designers and contractors. And when the principal designer's appointments end, no later than 28 days after the end of the appointment, the exiting principal designer has to give to the client a document explaining the arrangements it put in place to fulfill the duties. And lastly, where a replacement principal designer is appointed, they must review the arrangements the previous principal designer put in place for fulfilling the duties so that all reasonable steps are taken to ensure that the design is in compliance with the relevant requirements. The higher risk building regulations extend the additional duties uh, further. The principal designer is required to ensure. The principal designer is required to ensure designs for the building work produced before a building control approval application are provided to the client to ensure that the client can include them in the golden thread. 
the golden thread is a term coined in Dame Judith Hackett's report on building safety and is part of the government's commitment to implement new methods of gathering, storing and maintaining key information about high risk buildings during their life cycle. Another additional duty is that the principal designer must establish and follow a mandatory reporting system for safety occurrences and must maintain it through the construction phase. Everything's appeared back on my screen now, so I can see it. Uh, there are competence uh, requirements as well. Uh, an individual has to have the skills, knowledge and behaviours necessary to carry out the particular role. For companies, you look at organisational capability. This means the appropriate management policies, procedures, systems and resources are in place to ensure that individuals under the control of organisations comply with their relevant competence requirements. The regulations clarify that necessary behaviours include compliance with relevant requirements, including refusing to carry out building work which does not comply with relevant requirements. Behaviours also include cooperation with others and refusing to carry out work that is beyond their skills, knowledge or expertise and asking for the assistance of others where necessary. The Building Safety Regulator has established an industry competence committee to work with it to provide guidance to facilitate an improvement of competence across the industry. The British Standards in Institution has also published publicly available guidelines which document the expected skills, knowledge, experience and behaviours with additional competences for higher risk buildings. And one final thing to note is that where a person ceases to satisfy the competence requirements, they must notify the person who asked them to carry out the work. So in the case of the principal contractor and principal designer, this will be the client. Obviously, there is a lot on the shoulders of a principal designer. To get appointed, the principal designer is going to have to demonstrate its credentials and competence. And I would say it's going to be worth investing some time to think about how you go about this. Is this something you can do in house? Do you need external support to showcase your skills? It's those sorts of considerations. Certainly, I've been interested in the debate surrounding the RIBA's initiative to launch a principal designer register. Some in the sector are legitimately questioning whether it is really necessary to undertake another test and incur another fee to demonstrate their credentials. Others see this though as a helpful route to secure appointments as a principal designer. When you are appointed, you obviously need to carefully check the terms of your appointment. How much detail is being included to reflect what is expected from you as principal designer. For me, the more clarity in the document, the better, as it will mean less scope for misunderstandings in the future. You also need to think about how you are going to manage information flow and the process for reviewing designs which are amended as the construction evolves. Remember, the client will be looking to you to have all the details being organised and ensuring that any design changes have been properly considered in the context of the relevant requirements will be important. I know from speaking to architectural technologists that if a client has brought together the right team 
and everyone is in place from an early stage, that makes your life easier. Certainly, it is going to greatly assist you in the future if, in fulfilling your duties, it's the case that the right team and the right competencies are there. And one advantage you have over the rest of your professional team is your invaluable practical experience. Putting it bluntly, your skill is ensuring that a design actually works in practice. So if you can couple that ability with working alongside other competent consultants, including fire engineers, from an early stage, the scheme is really going to benefit from your input and it's much more likely that you'll be better placed to fulfill your duties and roles as a principal designer as envisaged by the legislation. And that's the message to get across to clients. So the next topic I'd like to talk about is the status of collateral warranties. We already know that for the purposes of the Construction Act, the definition of a construction contract is wide and includes contracts with construction professionals. But the professional team will, of course, often be asked to provide collateral warranties to third parties. So I thought it would be interesting to look and see how the law on this has evolved. And we can find the answer in the Abbey Healthcare and Simply Construct case. In that case, the majority of the Court of Appeal held that a collateral warranty was a construction contract for the purposes of the Construction Act. So what were the facts in that case? Well, Simply Construct was engaged to carry out the construction of a care home under a building contract. In 2017, a long lease of the care home was granted to Abbey, and in 2018, fire, defect, fire safety defects were discovered in the care home. Another contractor rectified those defects, and in 2020, the freeholder requested that Simply Construct execute a collateral warranty in Abbey's favour. It did so in terms that it has performed and will continue to perform diligently its obligations under the contract. So pretty standard wording. Freeholder and Abbey both began adjudication proceedings against Simply Construct in respect of the defects. Both were awarded sums against Sim Simply Construct and both applied to the Technology and Construction Court for summary judgment to enforce the awards. Simply Contract maintained that the collateral warranty delivered to Abbey was not a construction contract for the purposes of the legislation, and so the adjudicator lacked jurisdiction. In the first instance decision, the judge, Martin Bowdry QC, agreed with Simply Construct and dismissed Abbey's summary judgment application. He gave way to the fact that the Abbey warranty had been executed four years after construction works under the main building contract had been completed and some months after rectification of the allegedly defective works had taken place. The judge concluded that at the time of execution, the Abbey warranty was akin to a warranty as to the state of affairs, both past and future, rather than a contract for the carrying out of construction operations under the legislation. Abbey obtained permission to appeal on the ground that the judge was wrong to say that the Abbey warranty was not a construction contract. Abbey's appeal to the Court of Appeal was successful and it was granted summary judgment. All judges agreed that a collateral warranty may be capable of being a construction contract in the right circumstances. They also agreed that collateral warranties may have retrospective effect if the parties so agree. 
i.e. take effect from a date prior to when it was executed. So overall, the current position is that a collateral warranty could be a construction contract under the Construction Act, depending on whether the warranty is warranting ongoing and future obligations rather than warranting a past state of affairs. But the case is going to the Supreme Court, so watch this space. Uh, and the reason for raising this issue is that if a warranty is capable of being a construction contract, then it means that a dispute under a warranty, you any, any warranty you provide, as well as under your appointment, can be referred to adjudication. Adjudication is a speedy form of dispute resolution, which is specific for the construction industry and is the third topic I'd like to cover. Adjudication was brought in in 1998 as part of the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act 1996. So how does adjudication work? Well, timing wise, any party to a construction contract can refer any dispute to adjudication at any time. All that needs to happen is for the dispute, whatever it is, to have crystallized. This could be a claim for losses arising from, say, an allegation that the original design was defective. And if you're not familiar with adjudication, the thing to bear in mind is that the party bringing the adjudication has a real advantage. It can prepare its claim for as long as it likes and commence the adjudication at a time of its choosing. And this is significant given the really tight timescales which apply. The adjudication process kicks off by the party wanting to refer a dispute to adjudication, they're called the referring party, serving a notice of adjudication. This document sets out the brief details of the dispute and importantly, the redress they are seeking. Then, within seven days of the notice of adjudication being served, two things need to happen. First of all, an adjudicator needs to be appointed. Who is the adjudicator? Well, if the warranty is silent on this, there are a number of nominating bodies to whom an application for the appointment of an adjudicator can be made. Secondly, once the adjudicator is appointed, and within seven days of the notice of adjudication being served, the referring party then has to serve its referral notice and all its supporting evidence. The referral notice sets out the claim in detail and legal submissions, and the supporting evidence can include things like witness statements, experts' reports, and whatever contemporaneous documents the referring party wants to rely on. So the referral notice and supporting documents can be a quite significant submission. But this is where the speediness of adjudication kicks in. First of all, from the date of service of the referral notice, the adjudicator has to make his or her decision within 28 days. This can be extended by agreement, but it's still a very condensed dispute procedure. Secondly, the standard direction is for the responding party to only have seven days to submit its response, including all the submissions, all the evidence it wants to rely on. So think about it for a minute. The referring party can have spent weeks, if not months, preparing its claim, and the responding party only has seven days to deal with it. It's brutal. So you and your team need to be ready to deal with an adjudication if you think one is coming. What's more, because, it, because an adjudication can start at any time, it could land just before or during a holiday period. I'm afraid that won't affect the timescales very much. You and your team will be expected to deal with it. 
So obviously procedures need to be put in place to ensure that a notice of adjudication is not missed if served during the holiday periods and can be dealt with. Back in 2004, my first son was born just before Christmas. At the same time, one of my clients was served with a notice of adjudication by a main contractor. They were obviously looking to catch my client out or at least cause maximum inconvenience. So I had one day off and I had to deal with the claim over the festive period. It got me out of changing nappies. But I've never really forgiven them. Once the response is in, there's likely to be another round of submissions before the adjudicator issues his or her decision. Those further submissions usually have to be turned around very quickly in a matter of days because of the date when the adjudicator's decision is due. Sometimes an adjudicator can request a meeting or hearing, but I'd say the more common approach is for it to be a paper only process. The status of an adjudicator's decision is that they are binding unless and until the same issue is finally decided by a court or arbitrator, or there is an agreement. I have to say, though, having been involved in many, many adjudications over the last 25 years, most parties have thrown so much time and cost into the adjudication process, they usually end up living with the decision, even if it's not the outcome they wanted. And the courts are very much rubber stamping adjudicators' decisions if they are not complied with. There's a condensed summary judgment timeframe for enforcement proceedings in the Technology and Construction Court, and it's only in the cases of a breach of justice or an adjudicator acting outside of his or her jurisdiction will decisions not be enforced, and those situations are rare. So the main takeaway is to ensure that you get your ducks in a row if there's any hint of a dispute and things escalating further down the road. This means collating all the relevant information and having a plan in place as holiday periods are approaching to make sure there's enough cover and the right people to deal with any claim. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, Nathan, I'm happy to take any questions. If Nathan's there. Um, um, I am here and I'm now unmuted. <laughs> Sorry. No. I, I start I, I repeat myself. I started speaking and I realized as Andrew reminded me, I was on mute again. Yeah, so thank you, Andron. A great presentation there. Uh, some lots of lots of useful information. I do have quite a few uh questions. I, I think it was really useful in seeing the summary bullet points, the principal design of the duties, because there's a lot there's a lot of documentation out there trying to see sort of way through it all. So that, that's been really yeah. useful, I think. Yeah. Let's, let's see that summarised. If I go scroll up back to the top, there are a few questions. In fact, the first two are for me, I'm afraid. Uh, what, what do you think could be seen as reasonable steps by the principal designer that ensures all designers are complying with their duties under the building regulations? I, I suppose I'm thinking, if, if you're a principal designer, does that mean you've got to do a lot of check-in but how can you be sure that principal designers comply with their duties? Surely it's a, a designer's responsible, responsible for their own actions. So it's almost as if the principal yeah. designers take on liability for the other designers' actions. I, I don't that, know. That's where it goes, doesn't it? If you follow the, the thread through. Mm. So things like how often, how if you can document uh, your check-in process, if you can show whether that involves meeting or meetings with those who are designing, and just the keys to record what you're doing, I think okay. that will show at least evidence. Because if you are doing nothing, there's nothing to record, and that won't be that won't be reasonable steps. No, okay. You know, you're not expected to speak to someone every day, but some evidence of monthly meetings or uh, perhaps every couple of weeks, depending on where you are in the scheme, and also how you deal with maybe there's an employer change. How is that then dealt with among the design team? And what are you doing to coordinate that? Okay. And checking it in the context of the regulations. 
Okay. So I suppose, do you think e e email trails and sort of markups or design drawings, commenting on them, could that be evidence or part yeah. evidence? Perhaps? Yeah, that sort of well, thing, I suppose. Yeah, Some there's, there's no, at the moment, there's no Bible or textbook which will say, this is how you are shown to be a reasonable, you're taking all reasonable steps. Just be proactive, I guess, is the overall. Yeah, I think, I think, as you said, as long as you can demonstrate that there's an approach and a process taking place, hopefully that would be enough, hopefully. OK, thanks. Uh, and another one, are compliance declaration statements required for all buildings or higher risk buildings only? I think for the compliance. Let me just check that. I think that is for the higher risk buildings only. OK. okay. That, well, that they're the documents that the client has to provide. OK, so it's, 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 I, I, mean, I, I, it's, I'm getting confused perhaps by all the different guidance yeah. documents out there. So yeah. a compliance declaration statement is, is where you, a, a principal designer or a part of the team states how their design has complied with the yeah. regulations. So that's only required for high risk buildings. But if you I, say that's I, down, I, I'd understood that to be under the high risk building procedures. Yeah, OK. But, I mean, I, let's all check these points because it's all new, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah I, I'm still yeah not 100 up speed <laughs> and i think what, nathan i think what will happen is that the standard for higher risk buildings will just over time be what everyone does across the board yeah because then, it makes you, sense. then you are always yeah. complying with whatever the the building is sure that's a good approach okay uh darren higgins has asked are there any documents slash templates or guidance on competency declarations that are to be produced by clients uh i'm not sure if that means perhaps for clients so if, if, uh i think they're they're being produced i don't know where they are i think obviously you've got this industry competence committee and the british standards institutions that are producing guidelines and residents i don't know the answer to that question but i, I think okay and i suppose that i just pointed out there's all, there is the riba one i also believe that ciat are doing a competency uh register as well so that there could yeah. be industry bodies producing competency registers I, that, that might I be of some use. So. I would have thought yeah. so. I, mean, I, th I think our ICS is probably doing something similar perhaps as well. But. And maybe if you sign up to be one of the RIBAs on their register, maybe it comes with a pack of helpful documents, I don't know. Yeah, okay. So it sounds, it sounds like to begin with maybe start researching the industry organisations perhaps. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And a question for Matt Chapman. What if a client refuses to acknowledge his or her responsibilities? I, I've got my own thoughts on that, but I'll, I think yeah, it's you, Anjan. In the context of? The building, the building regulations, I suppose, and uh, the, well, the, 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 the client duties, I suppose. If the, if the client is not fulfilling its duties, it's a concern, isn't it? It's a real concern. Um, sorry, the lights have just come out in my room. One second. Oh, no. Here we go. Um, what do you do in that situation? You've you've got you've obviously got your obligations that you must continue with. They are there'd be a real concern if that's happening. What 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 do you think, Nathan? Personally, I, I think you need to put in take your views. Do you want to work with this client? Do you want, do you want to use of you know, withdraw your interest and, and saying sorry if you're not because willing to, to be uphold the regulations we're probably not going to work well going on together i, I think yeah, it's not it's, it's not a great sign is it if they're no. prepared to comply no. with their obligations and, in, and and particularly if in any way it's going to hinder or hamper the performance of your obligations because yeah. you know this there's, there's sharing information there's co how do you cooperate with a client who's not going to do anything yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of an alarm bell. Imagine if they got to yeah. site. That could be potentially a nightmare if they got to site. Yeah. <laughs> that, that could be an adjudication waiting to happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I suppose you need to weigh up how much do you want that work. I, I wouldn't take the risk, I suppose. Personally, yeah. I probably and on, wouldn't. But. And also, Nathan, at what point in the process is this happening? Yeah, this is a good point. So, I, I think I, I've actually started drafting out. Uh, Client emails myself actually for my practice to notify clients very early on about their duties to show point them towards the regulations and guidance and say, say please confirm to me that you understand what your duties are 
And I think it needs to be clear about that. I think it's yeah. similar to CDM duties. I think you need to make sure the client understands their duties yeah. and get their confirmation in writing somehow. Yeah. I mean, it's just totally unacceptable for a client to say, I don't, I'm not doing anything. And it's, it, yeah, especially if you've flagged up to them, say, read this document, read this, tell me, please confirm me, confirm me, you, you understand your, your duties. Yeah. And say, no, they don't. Then, yeah, I think you just make a decision, wouldn't you, about what's best for your practice going forward, I would have thought. Uh, another question that's probably been answered. There's another one for me, I'm afraid. Was the, with the onto the collateral warranty uh, yeah. topic? So, with that case you identified with the Abbey yeah. Care yeah. Home uh, yeah. project, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm misunderstanding it. So, was that collateral warranty put in place after the construction project was completed? So, it's a retrospective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, never, I, I didn't know that could happen. So, I, I also thought no, no. collateral warranty put in place before the project was completed. And commenced. I think that for, for you guys, it's very unlikely to happen yeah. in the future. So that's why I think it's more likely that your documents will be classed as construction contracts because they will be forward looking. You'll be talking about your obligations going forward as well as a retrospective statement of affairs. Yeah, OK, so it's, it's, it sounds like to me that that particular case then, was it put in place so they can make a claim for adjudication? Was that the only reason for it being in place? It's a bit odd why the contractor actually signed it. Yeah, yeah, that seems odd. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, uh, on to the next few questions. Can you, oh, yeah, I think it's another one for me, I'm afraid. Can you advise on any proactive actions slash behaviours before adjudication is started? I suppose yeah. it's trying to... Um, yeah, no, it's a good question. The flippant remark is to give me a call, but uh, it's all about marshalling the information. So obviously during the project, make sure the records are good because that becomes helpful later on. But getting information quickly in a coherent form is the best form of preparation. The last thing you want to be doing is someone's threatening you with an adjudication and you're flapping around saying, where was that, you know, putting together all the bits of information. I mean, it should be easier now with electronic documents, but equally, they can be quite overwhelming, the number of electronic documents, and sifting through the, the key ones is can be time consuming, and you just don't have time once that adjudication kicks off. Okay. So, to, so and then you also get, need to get your right team in place. So do you need an expert, legal help, all those sorts of things? Get Make those decisions quickly and early and just get your, it's a bit like an insurance policy. It might go away, but if you just get your things in place in the event it happens. So I've got maybe three jobs on the moment, at the moment where there's the possibility that an adjudication might be coming because the, the, the client can just sense the situation, if I can put it no higher than that. So they said, right, what, where do we want to be so that in, in, if it happens, we're not absolutely on the back foot? OK, I, I suppose, is there any way they could, that you can avoid adjudication, I suppose? Definitely, definitely. And a good advisor will do what they can to try and make that happen. So you would you know, you, you read the information, you assess it, and perhaps you put to the other side a more conciliatory way of dealing with the issue. And well, you just a, divert well, their attention away from that their only option is to adjudicate. Most of the time, that is the last resort because they've been met with silence or just yeah, a okay. blanket, blanket rejection. So, but there are definitely yeah. other more constructive means like mediation yeah, it could it could avoid uh, an adjudication or at least buy you time? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Okay, great. Uh, a another question has popped in. Jess Greensmith it is my understanding that the designer is responsible. I suppose also the principal designer is responsible rather than the practice under the Building Safety Act. Are there any implications from an insurance point of view if the worst should happen and something goes wrong? Uh, I, I personally thought that if, if you're employed by an architectural practice, 
it would be the architectural practice acting as a designer or principal designer, for example, or a structural that's engineer. Would be that's, the, how I've, that's how I've seen appointments so far. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's more the organisation, isn't it? Yeah, on the ones I've seen. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I mean, if, if that is the case, you want to be checking internally what the procedures are, because if someone is held, if you're being held out as an individual that doesn't have the benefit of the company's insurance, well, I think that's an internal discussion to start with. Yeah, I'd, I'd be surprised if that was the case, because I, I know a lot of PR insurance uh, schedules and policies, I think it's called subrogation, where the insurance company won't necessarily claim the individual, they only claim against the organisation. I think that's, I think it's unlikely that would be excluded. That's my understanding. So I like to think, hopefully, Jess, that would never be an issue, hopefully. Uh, and last question, hopefully, I think, with a private slash domestic project involvement up to planning stage and with the works then being carried out under a building notice, does the contractor take on the principal designer role and are we expected to monitor the contractor? Well, uh, shall we read that again? No, it's fine. I think it depends what you've been at, what your appointment is, um, and what, what you've been asked to do, I think, in that situation. If you've come in later on, then maybe you are, um, If you're coming on as a principal designer, you're effectively you're replacing what's gone on before. Remember what I talked about having to check what the the exiting PD has dealt with. I think it depends where you come along in the process. On. I, th I think also because it's a domestic project, I, th I think there's slightly different roles for the clients because they're, they're, I think they're, as I said that they're not going to be very familiar with the legislation. So I, I think the principal designer can take on their duties up to design up to construction stage and after that it's the principal contractor who takes on the client duties i think okay. and i think i expect to monitor the contract it depends on your appointment if, if you if you've been appointed only up to say building regulation stage then no you can't i don't think you can be expected to monitor the contract if you're not being employed to do that having to be expected to do work you're not being paid for I, I i think you need to check your appointment documents on what you've been uh, appointed yeah. for or not for it, i think it, it's definitely the starting point maybe. yeah okay uh and Sarah Louise Mikowski has asked, can you terminate a role under principal designer if prevented from fulfilling your duties? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> easy, easy, easy answer. Uh, and I, I yeah, because think... otherwise, you're in, otherwise you're in breach and um, you yourselves will, will be exposed. You, you obviously need to set out the reasons, but if you're unable to fulfil the statutory duties, that's that's a problem. And in fact, one of the um, things I talked about, wasn't it, was if if you can't carry out your obligations, you've got to you've got to cease. You've got to tell someone to your client. So, yeah, I think that's right. Which kind of ties a bit a bit with if your client won't cooperate with you, well, I can't. You can't fulfil your role. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, no other questions have come through, so I, I think if that's all the questions, I think maybe wrap it up. So uh, I'd like to say a big thank you, and John, for your time and uh, Pleasure. In, in presenting it and also preparing it. So thank you very much. And I suppose any, anybody here on the call on the team's presentation needs any legal advice, then and John is your man, I think, to yep, get involved. So, uh, just find me on LinkedIn and we'll take it from there. Great. Uh, yeah, there has been. A, I think that's it. So yeah, thank you very much, yeah. and John, and enjoy thank the rest of the Yeah, be in touch. Bye now. Yes, bye. Thanks.